Right, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to CMC Markets Non-Farm Payrolls webinar on Friday the 4th of December um, with me, Michael Hewson, um, where I'll be taking you through today's numbers. Hopefully we'll get a, an idea of how well the US economy is continuing to recover the 21 million jobs that it lost in the wake of the the March and April lockdowns. Thus far, we've recovered about half of that number, but jobs growth does appear to be starting to slow. And obviously that's a concern, I think, more broadly for US politicians on Capitol Hill. Over the course of the past few days and weeks, there has been some evidence that weekly jobless claims numbers have been starting to um, increase again. Um, we saw that um, with a big increase the week before last to 778,000. I know we did yesterday see a, a drop back to 712,000 jobs. That, that particular figure could have been skewed by the fact that there was a Thanksgiving holiday in the interim. But nonetheless, I think there is some anxiety amongst policy makers on Capitol Hill that maybe the US economy is starting to slow quite significantly. Certainly this week's ADB, ADP report was a little bit disappointing, um, coming in um, with only around about 365,000 jobs. Now, that was significantly below what an awful lot of people were expecting. Now, if we look at the market calendar, we can see that not only do we have a US payrolls report, we also have um, the Canadian jobs report as well. So um, as far as what we're looking for, I think the likelihood is this month's payrolls report will not have the same impact as previous months. And why do I say that? Well, I say that because I think most of the focus thus far, or over the course of the past two or three days, has been on these renewed stimulus talks. And I know a lot of you are probably going to roll your eyes. I certainly did when I heard that uh, Nancy Pelosi was talking to Steve Mnuchin, the US Treasury Secretary, the outgoing US Treasury Secretary, about the prospects of a new stimulus plan. But I think this time really is different because at the end of this month, the end of this year, the current CARES Act unemployment benefits expire. Now, unless there is a replacement stimulus package put in place, 12 million Americans will lose their unemployment benefits. Um, with all the blowback that could have on the US economy going into 2021. And that's going to be very significant if you, know, if you have concerns about the economic outlook and the concerns are well founded. Jerome Powell, head of the Federal Reserve, has outlined his concerns that in the absence of a fiscal response, an additional fiscal response from US policymakers, we will see the US economy economic output drop quite sharply in January and February, because ultimately 12 million Americans who have been in receipt of unemployment benefits under the CARES Act will lose them. So there is a deadline next week for some form of stimulus plan to start to form. And this stimulus plan is bipartisan. It's $908 billion, well below the $2 billion, $2 trillion rather, $2 trillion that the Democrats were pushing for before the election, but um, such 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 is such is the way things are at the moment. Um, I think that it's quite important that um, we understand that um, there are significant consequences to they're not actually agreeing a plan before the end of this month. So um, let me just get rid of that because that should not have come up. That's uh, technology for you. Um, so let's look at what we're expecting in terms of the numbers. You can find the economic calendar from the news and analysis drop-down window here. It takes you to the market calendar. 
and then you can then see what the forecasts are. So 481,000 is the consensus for non-farms for today, and that's down from the 638,000 that we saw in October. A week ago, this consensus was an awful lot higher. Um, so it has come down quite a bit. The unemployment rate is also expected to come down from 6.9% to 6.8. That's obviously very positive from where it was in April when it was at around about 14.7%. So that's a big decline, but let's not forget that the unemployment rate was down around about 3.5% in February this year. So it's still almost double what it was in February. And I think what's also important to remember is the participation rate, the US participation rate was at 63.4% in February, and it's now at 61.7%. 61 so that means that over 2% of that 2% decline as a result of US workers dropping out of the workforce. In other words, they are not looking for work because they're not optimistic about finding it. So I think going forward, um, the actual numbers are probably less important than what US policymakers are looking for with respect to a potential stimulus deal. In terms of the Canadian jobs report, we're expecting a rise of 20,000 new jobs in November. That's down from 83.6 in October. So I'm just going to drop that down and then we're going to have a quick look at the dollar index. This is the CMC dollar index. And those of you who are regular viewers of my weekly videos will know that um, I was suggesting that the dollar could well rebound as long as it held this particular support level here. Now that we've broken below it, the downside momentum in the dollar is likely to continue. And I think this is why this particular payrolls report is less important than say previous ones, because on a technical basis, we've seen a significant break lower in the direction of the US dollar, not only on our own dollar index, but also on the broadly more weighted dollar index. Um, that is the, the, the CRB dollar index. Also, if you look at the Bloomberg dollar index, we've also seen a move to the downside there. So what does that mean going forward? Well, essentially, if you're looking at euro dollar in terms of an in inverse correlation with the CRB dollar index, we have seen a significant breakout here. So even if we get a fairly decent payrolls numbers, pay payrolls number, which could cause the dollar to rally slightly, we probably won't see euro dollar fall back, fall back much below 121.20. That's where I'm identifying a key support level on euro dollar. So if we get a good payrolls report, we could see the dollar rally a little bit. But overall, now that we've broken towards the upside on euro dollar, I'm looking for a move to 125 over the course of the next three to four weeks. Um, so I think, you know, I think it's, it's important not to underestimate how important this 12070 area is. If I look at this as a weekly chart here, we can see that on this particular high here, it was also resistance. 120 was also a decent resistance there. It was also a decent low through that particular weekly candle there. So it's important not to underestimate the um, importance of this break higher. And on the basis of technical analysis here, if you if you take this as a triangular consolidation, with the horizontal line through there, a sloping trend line there, and you project this particular move higher, it gives you a minimum price objective of 122.30. So now that we've broken through 121.10.20, which is this particular level here, then we could well see further gains towards 122.30 as a minimum with a view to going towards 125 over the course of the next few weeks. As I say, these are technical breakouts. So essentially all I'm doing here is I'm applying a set of rules based on what the markets are telling me. So 
I've got a question here. COVID deaths are today at an all-time high. Stimulus is still doubtful, in my opinion, and Black Friday sales are down. Do you see a flight to safety in dollar strengthening compared to Canada? No, I, I don't. No, I, I really, really don't. Because I think when push comes to shove, I think the the odds of doing nothing now are much higher in terms of a US stimulus deal than they were, say, for example, three or four weeks ago. You've also got the vaccine news. You've got um, a whole host of positive catalysts driving sentiment here. Equity markets are higher. You've got um, weak, weakness, weakness in commodity prices. Investors, I think, market investors are much more comfortable buying stocks now than they were, say, for example, three or four weeks ago. And why is that? Essentially, it's because of the vaccine. The fact that the vaccine is going to get rolled out people can see light at the end of the tunnel. And the light at the end of the tunnel, <coughs> excuse me. And the light at the end of the tunnel is not a train coming the other way. Now, you want me to make the chart a little bit bigger on the screen? I'll certainly try my best for you, sir. Is that, is that any better? I'm hoping that's better. Okay, so hopefully you can you can see that a little bit better. So as I say, we've broken higher through 12070, and the prospect of a move towards I think 12230 is very much on the cards as long as long as we stay above these key levels here. So essentially the breakout level here and the 120 and the 120 and the 120, 110, 20 level here. As I say, it's all it's all about levels in terms of when you're trading currencies or any other market for that matter. And what we've seen at the moment is, well, over the course of the past few days, there's a significant breakdown in the dollar. The dollar usually acts as a safe haven. It's not acting as a safe haven right now. And until such times as I see signs of a reversal in sentiment, and at the moment I'm not seeing that, then really you've got to trade with the move, the trend. The trend is higher. So in terms of that, um, I think the line of least resistance at the moment, at the moment, is for further dollar weakness and further euro strength, further sterling strength. Now, you want me to have a quick look at the Russell. Um, the Russell, again, it's, it's looking fairly positive. You know, you can argue that US markets are looking very strong, and, and they most definitely are. But... The, you're getting higher lows and higher highs. And I think irrespective of the payrolls number, even if it's a good one, um, we will see further upside for stock markets going forward. It's the same thing for the S&P 500. It's the same thing for the, um, the Dow as well, and, and, and the DAX and the FTSE. If we look at this chart here, again, it's a similar sort of story when you actually look at the way the market is trading. It's, in, it's very much very much by the dips. And, you know, I think in that context, um, this is this is the way you've, you've really got to look at it. I think if if you're looking for a decent payrolls number, you could get a, a modest dollar rebound. But overall, I don't think it will change the overall narrative of a lower dollar going forward. Now, obviously, if stimulus talks do break down, and that's not, we're not going to know that for certain until um, the 10th of December next week, because that is the deadline for stimulus for a stimulus plan to get passed. So we've still got another four or five days where the prospect of a stimulus plan is being dangled in front of the market as a carrot. So until such times as that option is completely removed from the table, markets are going to react on the possibility that we're going to get one. And that's what it's about. It's about what the market expects until such times as it's no longer possible. So the market expects a Brexit deal. The market expects some form of stimulus package. And as a result, that suggests that we could well see further dollar weakness and further equity market gains. So and that for me, I think, is the important thing more than anything else. It's about expectations and deliverables. And at the moment, it's still possible to deliver a stimulus plan. And it's still possible to deliver an EU-UK trade deal. And the vaccine, the vaccine is happening. 
whether it be Pfizer, we're probably going to get an AstraZeneca and an Oxford vaccine as well. And that is that is what's fueling this momentum. And at the moment, the momentum is on risks side. So until such times as we get some evidence that it is that it is not, then ultimately it's really a case of buy the dips in terms of equity markets in general. You know, and I think that for me is, is the most important catalyst more than anything else. Now, I'm quickly being asked about gold. I'll quickly look at that because this is important. We're back at a very key resistance level here for gold. We've rallied quite nicely, but the key level for me is this 1848, 1850 area. This, this candlestick reversal pattern here is morning star. We've rebounded off 1763. That's held quite nicely. I'm still very much a case of buy the dips in gold prices, just basically on the back of dollar weakness more than anything else. But we could struggle to get through this 1845, 1850 level in the short to medium term. And I think that's going to be very, very important. I'm still a gold bull on the longer term, but we are in a downtrend at the moment. And this is going to be a significant barrier going forward. So gold prices at the moment, very much a case of buy the dips. Momentum is turning positive on my slow stochastic, but I think it's too soon for now to see a move higher through 1850 for gold prices, particularly ahead of the weekend. You've also got to bear in mind that ahead of the weekend, we could there is significant headline risk, I call it. Headline risk has a habit of undermining any short or long position. So for me, I'm still very much a buy the dip in gold prices, but at the moment, if I'm long on a particular move here, I'd be very cautious about where we are at the moment, because I think there's potential for a little bit of a pullback in the short to medium term to around about 1820, 1825. Right, we're just coming up to the 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 numbers now, the non-farm payrolls. For some reason they haven't appeared on my calendar, and I have absolutely no idea why. But as I say, we're looking for 481. An unemployment rate of 6.8%. And here we go. Six point seven, so that's good. 245, that's a really disappointing number. But in a perverse way, that's actually good because it's a disappointing number. It's going to concentrate minds on Capitol Hill. It's going to make them much more incentivized to arrive at a stimulus deal. So 245 is disappointing. Revision of the previous number six is revised down to 610 from 638. So that's pretty much a dollar negative, pretty much across the board, um, on the basis of the fact that it's going to really incentivize the potential for a stimulus deal, concentrate minds, they'll get a fiscal stimulus. The Federal Reserve is also meeting in two weeks' time. Um, so Headline numbers disappointing. The unemployment rate is lower. So again, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. I'm going to check the participation rate for you on my Bloomberg to see whether or not we've seen a significant fall in that to reflect the fall on the un in the unemployment rate. So bear with me a second while I dig that out. And 61.5. So yeah, I mean, basically the participation rates drop back. So even though that unemployment rate is lower, this is a result of more people dropping out of the workforce. So ultimately, it's not a particularly great employment report. Um, so it's it's a dollar negative. You're going to see euro dollar continue to push higher, the dollar to sink lower. Big level on the cable for anyone who's interested is 135.05. It's the highs from December last year, the post the post election peaks that we saw in the wake of the Conservative Party landslide win. That's likely to be a bit of a barrier in for this week. I would be surprised if we see a move above 135.10 in cable in the short to medium term. And in turn, I think that's likely to limit limit the upside in euro dollar perhaps to around about 122 in the short to medium term. But overall, um, pretty poor set of numbers in terms of the non-farm payrolls numbers. Now, what does that mean for dollar CAD? Because I was looking at the dollar CAD number. And that's a fairly positive number. So again, positive for the Canadian dollar, negative for the US dollar. That should push dollar CAD lower. Let's have a quick look at dollar CAD while I'm here. Um, and yeah, I mean, pretty much 
that is par for the course. If we look at the way the dollar CAD has traded over the course of the past two years, it's not hard to see what the direction of travel is there. So certainly looking for further further declines in dollar CAD towards 128 and potentially even, even lower over the course of the next few days and weeks. Certainly the next level that I've got as support for dollar CAD is the September 2018 lows at 127.80. Okay, so anyone have any other questions? I've, I've seen your question on copper. I will come to that in a moment. Um, UK 100, right, yes, I got asked about that on Sky News this morning. Um, FTSE 100, I'm still fairly bullish on it, and, and I'll tell you why. Um, if we look at the way the FTSE's behaved over the course of the past few days, we can see that we've seen a very strong move higher. Now, if I scroll back on this and I select year to date on my shortcuts, we are still 15% down on the year. If you compare that to the DAX, the DAX is pretty much flat. I don't think a stronger pound is going to impact the FTSE to the same extent as it has in the past. Simple reason being is the reason the FTSE has underperformed so much is because of the, the high correlation, high proportion of banks, commodity and retail stocks and aviation stocks, hospitality and leisure stocks that it currently has in it. You've got the likes of Rolls-Royce, IAG, who own British Airways. You've got IHG, International Hotels Group, who own the Holiday Inn chain. You've got Whitbread, who own um, Premier Inn. You've obviously got the four major banks. Um, you've also got BP and Royal Dutch Shell. All of those stocks have been hit the hardest. In terms of a vaccine bounce back, you've seen a significant rebound in the more bombed out areas of the FTSE 100, the UK stock market. So you then should see a significantly robust rebound. Now, if we can hold above six and a half thousand, then I think over the course of the next few months, we should see a move back to 7,000. Let's not forget, we're all the way back at 7,300 at the beginning of this year, and we're at six and a half thousand now. So there's plenty of potential, even with cable at current levels, Richard, for us to go an awful lot higher. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. The cable may act as a little bit of a drag, but I don't think it'll act as a significant drag. And I think that's the, the I think that is the biggest concern going forward. Um, so for me, I'm very much of the opinion that the FTSE 100 has got potentially a significant amount of more upside because it has to play catch up with, say, for example, the CAC, which is only 8% down year to, year to date, and the DAX, which has pretty much recovered all its post-pandemic losses. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Um, so that's the FTSE 100. I'm, I'm, fairly, I'm fairly constructive on that. Um, talking about cable, sterling dollar, uh, as I said previously, 135 is a big level, 135.10. In the short term, I don't see it much above that, even though even though I can still see cable going to 140 over the course of the next three to six months. I'm fairly constructive on the pound on the back of a weaker dollar. Obviously, the Brexit, UK, EU trade talks are going to play a part in where cable goes. But overall, I think they'll come to some form of fudge that will get us over the end of the 31st of December deadline. Is a no-deal Brexit disastrous all round for UK and EU stocks? Um, no, because I think they will have, they will somehow avoid that outcome. There'll be some form of deal. It's not going to be ideal. It will be it will be fudge 101, but ultimately there will be some form of accommodation because the the, the economic situations warrant it. If you look at the, the French economy, you look at the Italian economy, you look at the Spanish economy, the shutdowns, the restrictions, the hospitalizations, the economic, um, the, the services PMI numbers that we've seen over the course of the past two or three months, 
it would be utterly irresponsible for policymakers on both sides of the channel, in Brussels, in France, and here in the UK, to have a no deal Brexit at the end of this month. Utterly irresponsible. Now, that's not to say that they couldn't have won by mistake, but I think once it becomes apparent that on the 1st of January, that the situation is unsustainable, there would be measures put in place to mitigate the worst effects of a no deal Brexit. And I say no deal Brexit in inverted commas, because I think there will be some form of deal put in place to make sure that the worst effects are mitigated by and large. And if it's bad for the, if it's bad for France, it'll be even worse for Ireland. So, you know, it's not a zero sum game here. It's not that a no deal Brexit is just bad for the UK and it's, you know, and, and it can be absorbed by everything else. We've got an ECB rate meeting next week, and that is likely to um, see the ECB extend their PEP program for another six to 12 months. At the moment, it expires June 2021. I think you'll find they'll extend that towards the end of 2021 to the middle of 2022. So I think policymakers will do whatever they can to keep markets moving higher. And at the moment, I think the bigger problem that Europe have at the moment is not a no deal Brexit. It's this recovery plan that's currently being vetoed by Hungary and Poland. They need to find a way around that rather than worry too much about, um, you know, new trade terms between the UK and the European Union. There is a deal there to be had, you know, and are they really going to throw away everything that they've discussed right now? on the altar of fishing and a level playing field. I don't think that they will. So I think for me, um, it's still all to play for. Um, OK, so um, I'm being asked about. Yeah, let me ask. Let me ask you answer your question about copper, sir. Um, well, I mean, I think it's fairly clear from that. Um, the line of least resistance for copper Let's go to a weekly chart here because that tells us all we need to know. Um, the next key resistance for copper is 360. I still think that we've, we've still got potential to go um, quite a bit higher. Um, the biggest, the biggest, um, the biggest driver for copper demand generally tends to be out of China. China's doing well at the moment, and uh, and I think uh, Chinese economic activity has proved to be fairly resilient. We've got China trade numbers coming out on Monday, so keep an eye out for them, import and export data. If we see fairly decent import and export data, that's likely to give copper an additional lift going forward. But I think we may find a little bit of a barrier as we approach 360 in the short to medium term. So keep an eye on the China trade data, which comes out um, Monday in Asia. Gold prices I talked about earlier, I think there is a bit of a barrier um, anywhere near 1845, 1850. I think we could see a little bit of a drop back down to 1820, 25. But overall, I am fairly constructive on gold prices, despite the fact that we've seen a little bit of a sell off in the past two or three months. Overall, I still expect gold to go back to $1,900 an ounce over the course of the next couple of months. Um, looking, looking at um, being asked about Bitcoin and Ethereum. Mm, yes, yeah, not. I mean, basically, with Bitcoin, the biggest problem you've got with that at the moment is you've got a bit of a barrier at twenty thousand. Um, so it's going to be very, very difficult to move above the previous highs, as seen from here. If you look here and you look here, you've got a very significant barrier at twenty thousand which means that you're going to have to be very, very cautious about being long of Bitcoin anywhere below that um, on a technical basis is a very, very big ask to get above 20,000 in the short to medium term. So I think there's certainly potential in Bitcoin to come all the way back um, to around about 15 and 12,000. Um, so I'd be very, very cautious about being long of crypto. I'm not a big fan of crypto, I have to say. 
um, going forward. And as a result, that may and because it's such a it's because it's such an illiquid market, it makes it very very difficult to trade with any degree of certainty. And we are well up on the year. We've we've made significant gains this year. And while I still think that we could well go higher. I think in the short term we could see some significant moves towards the downside. Um, natural gas, natural gas. I'm being asked about. Here we go. Natural gas. This is a nice little chart that I've drawn here. Very much by the dips mode for natural gas. We have seen a bit of a drop in the past day or so, but since June we've been in a fairly nice uptrend on the daily charts. If we can hold above this trend line here then there's no reason why we can't continue to move higher. So looking at this trend line in the natural gas uh, contract suggests that while we're above this trend line from the June lows, then we could well see further gains going forward. So any stop loss would really need to be below this trend line that I've drawn in from those lows there. Um, Tesla, well, Tesla, indeed, Tesla is always a good one. Let's have a quick look at uh, um, car manufacturers, my car manufacturers watch list. Here we go. Well, there's no prizes for guessing. That's very much by the dip mode at the moment. $600 is a bit of a barrier at the moment. Um, but um, given the way Tesla trades, I wouldn't rule it out. But I think Buying at these sorts of levels is a highly risky endeavor. I think there's certainly scope for it to drift back down towards around about $500. This, 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 this set of previous highs here, certainly not an area I would be comfortable buying Tesla shares at um, near the all-time highs. I still, you know, it's very, I'm very much, I'm, I'm of the opinion that you trade the market when it's close to support levels. You buy into a market when it's near support, you sell it when it's near resistance. And for me, I think if I was going to be buying Tesla, I'd be looking to buy it on a dip back towards this blue line that I've drawn in here or the, the line through these series of lows through here. It's all about seizing the opportunity when it becomes available. So wait for the market to come to you rather than you try to jump on the back of a trend that may start that may be starting to fizzle out. Silver being asked about silver. Quite happy to talk about silver. Similar sort of story here with relative to gold, where it's, we're looking to approach trend line resistance from the highs here. We've seen a decent rebound from these lows here. If I draw in a horizontal line through these lows here, Decent support in and around $21.5 an ounce. But there's resistance, starting to approach resistance from the peaks in August. So it does appear to have found a little bit of a base in the short term. To push higher, we need to push through these this trend line support here to retest $26 in the short to medium term. But overall, I think if you're if you're bullish, if you're fairly bullish on gold. You, you you can also be potentially bullish on silver as well. But again, it's about timing your entry. And at the moment, given where we are now, relative to where we were on Monday, I'd probably wait for a dip in silver before contemplating getting back into that particular market. OK, um, trying to see whether or not I've got there are any other questions. One thing I would make you all aware of, ladies and gents, is We've got the ECB next week. Um, I'm going to quickly talk you through Euro Sterling because I think Euro Sterling could be quite interesting as a barometer of where we go to next. And at the moment, even though we've broken above this trend line resistance, which I talked about in great length in my previous videos, we haven't been able to take out these series of highs at 9070. The next key level for me on the downside is 90. 0 0.9000. If we push back below 90 level, then we could well head back towards this very, very big, big level at 8860. So 8860 is the next key support if, if we break below 
the 90 level, which has acted as resistance here, 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 and here, and support yesterday. So that 90 level is a big, big level for euro sterling. If we can hold above it, we should go back to 9070. If we break below 8990, 8980, then we've got a good chance of retesting the lows all the way back in November at 8860. Again, it's about levels. So how it behaves between 8990 and 90 will determine the next underlying move in euro sterling. In terms of the dollar index, I'm a seller of the dollar index on rallies in the same way that I'm a seller of the CMC dollar index on rallies as well. If you look at the dollar index, you're essentially looking at euro dollar upside down because euro dollar makes up 57% of the dollar index. So the fact that euro dollar has broken higher means that the dollar index should break lower. Okay, so at the moment, euro dollar has tried to go higher. It's tried to go through 120.180. It's losing a little bit of momentum going forward. And as such, we could see a retest of 121.15, 121.20. Okay, so um, I'm still very much a seller of the dollar on rallies, but we could see euro dollar start to drift back down towards 121.20, given the gains we've already seen this week. And we have an ECB rate meeting next week. So you could see some of these euro longs that we've seen this week start to get tapered off as we head into next week. I'm still very much of the opinion that in a straight fight between the Fed and the ECB, the Fed is going to win in terms of where it wants to go in terms of monetary policy. So it doesn't change my view that euro dollar won't go towards 125. But given where we were a week ago and where we are now, we could see a pullback in the interim. And we could head back towards this this red line here on a break below 121.20. Okay, so see, da, 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 we don't do the Nigerian nearer. Um, so in answer to your question, best market in 2021 has been renewables. If we look at best, I got asked about baskets um, a, f a few minutes ago. If we look at if we look at baskets, ladies and gentlemen, they're here. Go to share baskets. And we've got a whole host of share baskets. Um, big tech, China tech, cannabis, if you're that way inclined, driverless cars, EU motor, automobiles, banks, European banks, UK banks, US banks. If we look at renewable energy and compare that to driverless cars and big techs, Look how renewable energy is performed relative to remote lifestyle, driverless cars, and big tech. Now, obviously, renewable energy are much smaller cap stocks. And as a result, there's more froth in them. But if you want to know how we construct our baskets, go to the CMC Markets website and then look at share baskets, which are right there. And then that basically gives you the breakdown of how we construct our various baskets. So if we go, for example, to say, for example, renewable energy, we can then display that there and you can see that how that's, that's performed relative to the other markets. We scroll all the way down here, go to renewable energy. It then shows you the weightings and the makeup of each stock and each individual basket. So you can see the renewable energy one has 17 renewable energy stocks within it, including plug power, first solar, and what have you. And we have that for all the major markets. So you've got big tech, we'll go to that there, and you can see that you've got Alphabet, Apple, got 20 stocks in there, Facebook, Microsoft, so on and so forth. Okay. So you you can you can you can you can sort of see that straight away from there. And you can do that you can do that for a pretty much 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 all the baskets um for weed weed stocks if you like. So you know we've got we've got a whole host of 
um, products that you can trade in terms of cannabis. So you go to cannabis basket there, and you've got that particular, and it's got canopy energy in it. Can it's not canopy energy, canopy, canopy in there, canopy growth, um, and other and a whole host of other cannabis stocks. But again, they're very, very, how should we say, volatile. So you've got to be very, very careful if you're trading those particular those particular markets. Um, CMC CNH index. Okay, so let's let's have a look for that. Forex indices. Here we go. There it is. Load that. I mean, if you look at the CNH index or if you look at the dollar CNH, which I've got down here, it gives you it sort of gives you a fairly similar idea of where we are. If I'm just I'm just going to push that um, push that, come back to that in a minute, um, Ryan, and then we can look at CNH. I did some analysis a few weeks ago on the Remnimbi, and I think there's potential for us to move back to 6.49 on the offshore one. The reason being, we've we traded out of this sideways consolidation here. If you project that move lower, the minimum price objective is for 6.49. So if we're projecting a one at 6.49, you're going to be projecting a broadly lower dollar anyway, which suggests to me that there's further dollar downside over the course of the next few weeks. So I'm very much of the opinion that while we remain below 660 on the offshore one, then we're likely to see 649 in due course. Of course, that will then mean that the CNH index should go higher. So hopefully, Ryan, that answers your question. Let me just zoom that up so you can actually see the levels that I'm talking about. And hopefully that helps. No worries at all. Um, looking at the RAND, it's going to be a fairly similar story here, though we do appear to be finding a little bit, a little bit of a base, but ultimately the direction of travel here is fairly clear. The RAND still looks fairly strong. It's certainly the dollar has weakened quite substantively, broken below those very key support level there. And I would suggest that the RAND has the potential to strengthen further if we break below this low of a few days ago at the end of November of around about 15, 15, 0, 15 10, there or thereabouts. If we break below 15, 10, we could well see further further end strength going forward. The dollar looks broadly weak across the board. And I think while equity markets remain fairly well supported, then the dollar is likely to suffer pretty much across the board. Okay, so um, with respect to renewables utility stock, I can't really advise you one way or the other there. Um, you know, I can't give you advice on what you should or shouldn't do. I think it's best you, you talk to a, a, you know, a financial advisor on that regard. Um, you know, it's a tough one. Um, does anyone have any other questions, ladies and gents, before I wrap this up? Um, as I say, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, I do have a week ahead video. Um, if you want to find out about any market analysis or what have you, go to the news and analysis, the insights section on the website. We've got a whole host. We've got Airbnb next week, ladies and gentlemen, the Airbnb IPO. Um, I think there's a, you know, that, that should that should generate some fairly decent interest when it starts pricing on the 10th of December. You can read all about that here. I've written a quick pricey on the news and analysis section of the website. So that's under insights. That's where you can read all the commentary about the markets and what have you. Um, so Airbnb, that, that, get, that goes out of the door on the 10th of December. Being asked to look at the DAX, more than happy to do that. Um, still a big barrier in the DAX around about 13,460. We can see that here. Let me just zoom that in for you. 
I think that's going to continue to underperform. I think um, there's a big barrier around about 13,460. Um, there's certainly potential for more upside on the FTSE than there is the DAX at the moment. But if we do break this high here, then we've certainly got potential to go back to the highs that we saw in February. But at the moment, year to date, the DAX is just below where it was when it started. And now I've got a little button called year to date up here, which basically snaps it straight back to the 1st of January. That can be found in this column here and just select the star year to date and it will then appear in the column, this menu bar up here. So any options where you will have a star, you enable it, it will then appear as an option in the toolbar and it will save you having to access the drop down menu. So hopefully that helps you. I just noticed someone asked me about dollar yen. Let me have a quick look at that for you. For me, I still think we're going to see a retest of these lows that we saw back in November of 103.15, 103.20. At the moment, there's decent resistance around about 104.70, 104.80. Um, uh, and as such, as long as we stay below this series of highs through here, you can see this dollar yen trend is very much for a lower dollar and a higher yen. As long as we're back below here, I think we can retest these lows back here around about 103.15, 103.20. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I'm hoping that um, you found all of that um, useful. Um, I'd like to all wish you all a very nice weekend and um, a restful one. And hopefully, um, hopefully you will have a successful, successful week next week trading the the various headlines that I outlined um, just now. Um, so just quickly recapping that, we've got an ECB rate meeting on the 10th. We've got an EU summit on the 10th as well, which should outline, um, hopefully outline, rubber stamp an EU-UK trade deal. We've got China trade on Monday. We've got a Bank of Canada rate meeting on the 9th of December. And we've also got the Airbnb IPO on the 10th as well. Um, okay, which question was that? Was that Ethereum? Because I think I covered that earlier, um, Ethereum. Yeah, I mean, with Ethereum at the moment, it looks very overbought to me. It's very near the highs. With Bitcoin, with Bitcoin looking a little bit soft, I would be reluctant to be going long of Ethereum at these sorts of levels, um, given given what Bitcoin is doing at the moment and given the fact that Bitcoin has a very big top at 20,000. So, you know, we're looking at the 200 day moving average. We're quite a long way away from it. You know, if you're looking to get into Ethereum, I probably wouldn't be looking to do it quite yet. Um, hopefully that answers your question on Ethereum. Going back, um, as I say, thanks very much for listening, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I hope you've found today's webinar useful if you have please um, please send some positive feedback in about 24 hours time you'll be getting a follow-up email from me um, for feedback please be nice <laughs> um, and if there's anything that you'd like me to cover that I haven't covered in this video for future or this this webinar for future webinars please let me know because ultimately these webinars are all about you and a, a guide, an educational guide for you. So thanks again for listening. Um, hope you all have a great weekend and um, see you all next year because this will be the last non-farm payrolls webinar um, for this year. Thanks a lot and cheers. And before I go, yes, you can you can access the recording of the webinar. It will go on YouTube in the next couple of hours and I will tweet the link out. So um, it goes it does go out. The recording does go out on youtube.com forward slash CMC Markets PLC. And if I don't speak to you, any of you before, have a great Christmas, have a great new year, 
and see you all next year. Thanks a lot. Walkthrough style webinars, absolutely. We can talk about that. We can do them separately. Um, but we will we will we will certainly definitely look at that as well. Thank you, Paul. Cheers.